Hello, can you hear me now? Oh, that sounds better. All right. So on Friday, Jeff foreshadowed these things called functions. And functions are a way to structure your code, break it up into pieces that you can uh, reuse, and you can test. And we're very excited. This is going to be great. But before we get into this, I'd like to take a moment, uh, talk about how we're going in the class. This is, at this point in the semester, it's the third week of class, and we're getting into something of a rhythm. Oh, hi, can you help me with this? Yes. All right, is that better? Can, is, is that working? How about now? All right, can everyone hear me now? Hello? All right, can you hear me now? Well, I guess I can't help you. How about now? All right, then I'm sorry, Matt, you can use your mic by the whole bit about the rest of the week. All right, that's no problem. We will survive. So, as I was saying, uh, this is the third week of class, and we're getting into something of a rhythm. This uh, class is intense. You've probably, uh, <laughs> I'm starting to discover this. Um, but we try to maintain a consistent level of difficulty. So the reason we've been doing weekend homework problems is to prepare you uh, for working on our machine project, the MP. We are going to lay off the weekend homework problems pretty much from now on because, again, we want uh, you to be working on the MP instead. So the MPs are obviously they're they're longer than the homework problems you have longer to do them which means that the scheduling of them is more up to you uh, we highly recommend that you get started early be, uh, they are designed to be doable in slow and steady uh, progression they are not designed to be done in a frantic rush the night before if you try that not going to work out so hot so let's go over how uh, we're settling in here so on sunday mo and monday depending on your deadline group you're going to either be finishing up the first half of each checkpoint, that is for the early deadline points, uh, or you'll be finishing up the checkpoint as a whole, um, and starting the next checkpoint that we release if we're on a, a checkpoint boundary. On Monday, the MP continues, of course. Uh, our quizzes in the CBTF run from Monday through Wednesday, and we have class right here, as we're doing now. We have our weekly homework, uh, daily on weeks homework problems, and our office hours run from noon to eight. Tuesday, you'll continue working on the MP. You'll, this is a very repeating theme. The quiz continues in the CBTF, and you all have your labs on Tuesday. And of course, another homework problem. Wednesday, fairly similar to Monday. The quiz is still proceeding. We've got class. We've got homework. We've got more office hours. Thursday is a really great day to make a lot of progress on the MP, because there's no CBTF quiz going on, and we have lots and lots of office hours. On Friday, again, we're here and there's office hours happening. And the weekend, we lay off the homework problems, and you have plenty of time to work on the MP. Office hours run noon to eight, Saturdays and Sundays. So, so far in this class, we've learned some really important fundamentals. We are able to do uh, basic math using uh, the arithmetic operators. We can make simple decisions using uh, if statements. We can do a lot of things over and over again, even a variable number of times, using loops. We can store data in variables and arrays. And computers are also very good at communicating. Uh, obviously, this is a very important part of the world. People are constantly sharing information over the web. And we're going to get to how that happens. It's going to be very exciting. So now that we have these fundamentals, what are we going to be doing? We're going to be thinking about how to use these. Uh, we're going to put these building blocks together to make algorithms to solve our real world problems or, or data processing tasks. And we're going to consider how to lay out data so that we can process it effectively. Of course, people, uh, there's this big rage on about now about data science. Uh, but data structures have always been a really, really important part of computer science. Uh, there's different trade-offs uh, between different ways of structuring the data and how you can access that. And we're going to learn how to do this in a way that is reasonable, in a way that is maintainable. And we're going to learn the craft because say, 
I might know how to use all the kitchen accoutrements. Uh, that doesn't necessarily make me a chef, and people can attest that I can't cook very well. So the craft is another layer on top of the, the tools. And along the way, outside of the, the really critical parts about Java and programming in general, we're going to take just a couple fun detours into things like compilation. Just really exciting bits about how this all works. Very fun. Now, how do we lay out our programs in a good way that allows us to maintain them and reason about them well? We want to organize it. Imagine if you were reading the syllabus for this class, and imagine that there were no uh, section breaks. It was all just a giant wall of text. That, that would be a mess. You <laughs> it would be innavigable. So we organize it. We have links between things so that we don't have to repeat ourselves constantly. And functions, which we're talking about today, are going to allow us to do that. Because if your entire program is just one long sequence of instructions, if something is going wrong, it's very hard to investigate. The problem could be anywhere. But if we break it apart into more or less independent chunks, then you can test in isolation. And once you've identified that the problem is in one chunk, you can fix that chunk. We're going to combine state and behavior. This is foreshadowing of something called objects, which I think is going to be uh, either later this week or next. Uh, and this allows us to put the behavior, that is the code, the processing, organize it next to the things that it operates on so that you don't have to trawl through the entire code base to find what is this related to, why is, why is it here. We're going to learn how to write good documentation so that we can understand our code later, so that other people, uh, maybe our partners in a, a hot new startup, will be able to understand what we've done, and uh, so that, of course, once we've come back after a long break, we still know what's going on. Computer scientists are, you might go so far as to say, fundamentally lazy. We want to not do another thing if it's already been done, because if we have an existing solution, fantastic. Use that. And structuring programs well allows us to do that. And once we've organized everything well, documented it wonderfully, other people can use our code, and that will help them uh, avoid code duplication. It will help them build fantastic stuff on top of our foundation. So you're communicating and contributing to software development as a whole. So here's Wikipedia's definition of a function. A sequence of program instructions, that is a bunch of code, just code, like we've been writing so far that perform a specific task. That is, they accomplish one thing. Maybe it's their job to find the maximum of an array, like uh, we did on this weekend's homework problem and we'll review later today. Uh, this unit can then be used in programs whenever that particular task should be performed. That is, once you have a function that accomplishes some task, you don't need to copy paste that code all over the place. All you need to do is invoke the function and it will do the job. So different programming languages have somewhat different conceptions about functions. These are more or less shared, but we'll, we're going to talk about Java specifically. So it gets a handful of inputs, or none in some cases, and it either returns nothing, it just does something and doesn't have an answer, or it produces an output, one response. Uh, for example, in the homework problems, it's very common that you need to find something given some input. Uh, like the sum of an array, the input would be the array, and the output would be the, the sum. And there's nothing super magical about code inside the function. It's just imperative code uh, like we've been writing, and it's packaged up in a nice way so that we can use it elsewhere. Now, you can, like I just said, put all sorts of code inside a function. What should you put inside a function? How should you um, plan this out? In general, a function should have one responsibility, perform one atomic, um, that is, specific task. Like, it would be somewhat bizarre if our array sum function uh, was also responsible for emailing something to someone. We wouldn't want that in the same function, because its one job is to sum an array. That's what it's for. We want it to be easily tested so that if something is going wrong in our program, we can say, well, let's see if the, the problem is here. We exhaustively test that function. We say, oh, OK, that function is behaving properly, so we can move on to the next part of our code. So we don't have to test the entire program all at once. And you'll see some of this in the MP. And it can be reused in multiple places so that rather than copy-pasting code all around the place, because what if 
uh, we made a mistake in our original implementation and then that got copied everywhere, that would be a mess to clean up. So instead we package it into a function where if we have a mistake, we change it once and then all users of the function will get the updated behavior once we fixed it. Now, how do we actually write one of these things that I've been spieling on about for 12 minutes? This is a function declaration in Java. First, the thing you'll notice is that it has a name, just like variables have names, functions have names too. So you can refer to them. The inputs for a function, what it receives, are called arguments, often they'll be referred to as parameters, and that is the part inside the parentheses. These look very much like variable declarations. They have a type, an int for this first number, so what this first part here is saying is that one of the first parameter to our add function is an int, which inside the function will be referred to as first number. And then we also have another parameter, it's also an int, and it's called second number. And then, much like uh, loops or if statements, functions have a body that is delimited by curly braces. Everything inside the function is run when the function is called. Above the, all this code, you will see some fairly human readable text, all this uh, big comment. And this is referred to as a javadoc comment, Java documentation. Its purpose is to explain what the function is for, so that humans can understand why it's here, why we might use it, and how to use it. So the first part is a general summary. So the job of this function is to add two numbers together. And then the other parts say what is expected to be passed to the function. These param tags say, oh, the function takes something called first number, and that is the first number to add. And then the param second number, that's the other input, that's the second number to add. And then what does it return? The sum of those two numbers. You're going to see a lot of these comments in the MP uh, code to describe what the function is supposed to do. Now, strictly speaking, since they're comments, they are not necessary for the compiler. However, once you start writing your own functions in a later MP checkpoint, uh, check style will require that you add appropriate Java doc. Nano Studio can help with this, it can help you format it. Uh, we think it's really important to write Java doc so that, again, other people and you later can understand what the function is for and how to use it. Java cares quite a bit about the arguments and return type, so when we try to use a function, Java is going to check for us that the things we're passing to it are actually of the type the function expects. And again, the Java doc helps both you and it helps other people who are using your function because if we just, there's only so much information you can pack into the function name. And if you want to explain it more, Java doc. So now, we've written this fantastic function, it does something super amazing, and now we want to actually run it from somewhere else in our code because just the act of declaring a function doesn't, doesn't run it, it's just there now. So to call it, you, we will use some syntax involving parentheses that we will show very shortly. Once you call a function, you tr execution transfers immediately to that uh, function. We're gonna see examples of this real quick. The code that is the calling, excuse me, the code that calls the function, caller, makes sense. And so once we've started the execution of a function, that called function is going to run to completion and only once it completes will the function that called it continue executing. And again, we'll, we'll see the control flow very soon. If the function returns something, not all functions do, but if the function returns something, then it can be used like any other expression. So here is an example of calling our add function. From lines one to 10 is the add functions declaration, and from lines 11 to 15 is some loose code that takes advantage of it. Now, I uh, need to shatter a bit of an illusion here. From until now, we've been using just instructions, just Java statements in our slide examples and in the homeworks, but Java actually does not allow uh, just loose code outside of functions. If you try that in an independent Java file outside of our system, it will not work. Java requires that ev all executable code is packaged into a function, well, mostly. 
So we've been doing a little bit of magic behind the scenes to make it so that it'll be put into a function so that we can test it. But anyway, we have this function, and we're going to use it to add the numbers 3 and 4. You may notice that this syntax looks somewhat familiar considering line 14, because system.out.println, which we've been using uh, all this time, is a function. println is a function, and calling it involves these parentheses. So we name the function that we want to call, we give the value of the first parameter, and so on through all the rest of the parameters. Uh, the parameter values have to be separated by commas, and check style will want to space after them. So this line 11 declares result. Java, to fill that out, has to evaluate the expression on the right-hand side, which is a function called add. And once we've done that, result now has set. Likewise, you don't have to store it into an intermediate. You can just use it as any other expression. You could say add 4 and 5 and pass that straight through to system.out.println. So line 12 is going to evaluate add first. Execution will transfer to line 9, where it will add 4 and 5. When it hits the return statement, it will proceed back to the caller. And now system.out.println has that value it can work with and send out to the console. You can have multiple function calls in one expression, just like this line on line 13. Java will evaluate one at a time. First it'll add 10 and 20, then 20 and 30, and then once you put all that together, you store it into bigger result. And if even if a function returns a value, you are not required to do anything with that value. So line 15 is perfectly fine. It will call the add function. Add will dutifully add those two numbers, except the result gets thrown away by the caller. Sometimes it is reasonable to throw away the result. Uh, maybe you were using the function for a side effect that is something other than just the return value. So let's actually run some code. Now first up, you'll notice this weird static word here. This is an artifact of our slide system. Just ignore it for now. Do not include static in the Prairie Learn problems. If you do, I think things will break. Uh, but for now, just no, we'll talk about it later. We, we will, later in the class. So we run the code. We get 9. Where is that coming from? Probably this line right here. And where is the 90 coming from? We add all this together, and we print it. Now let's maybe get a sense of the control flow by adding some extra print statements. And whenever you're debugging something like your MP, it's really helpful to just add print statements to say where we are now and get a sense of how Java is running your code. So let's, I'm going to have to type one-handed here. This is at the start, before we've called any of our add function. Now let's add code to the add, so we'll be able to see when it's run. I think since I'm typing one-handed, it'd be best for me to copy this. And we might as well print the parameter values as well, uh, so we can see which call we're in. And let's uh, make a note of when we get back from add. And let's see what happens here. Obviously, I haven't instrumented the entire thing, but I think we'll get a pretty good sense here. So just declaring a function does not run it, so we're not going to start inside the add function. Instead, execution will begin on line 6. That's the, the beginning of our imperative code here. And to get this result, we're going to need to invoke the add function. So Java transfers control into the body of the add function, where we note that we are adding 3 and 4. And once we hit this return statement, we return to where we came from before the function was called, and we hit line 8, which notes that we are now done adding 3 and 4. In the process of executing line 9, which is a print statement of an add 
function call, we first have to evaluate that because we don't know what to print, we don't know what to call println with until we've evaluated the inside of this uh, call. So we add four and five, and then once that is done, this is ready to go and we pass the resulting nine to println. When you have multiple function calls, Java has to do them one at a time, so we scroll down here and we see that first Java added 10 and 20, and then 20 and 30, and then once we got all that, we got 90. And line 12, just to prove that Java does actually run the function, even if you ignore its return value, we see adding 6 and 7 at the bottom, even though we threw away the result of 13. So much like variables, functions have names, and these names are going to be used whenever we call them. So how do we name a function well? We want to be a script. We want the name to mean something. In uh, quizzes, there might be functional names like a, because we want you to figure out what the function does uh, and describe it to us. But when you're writing code, the function name should mean something so you can remember. And it should describe that specific function. Sometimes maybe you have a plan for a function, what you think it's going to do, and as the code develops, it ends up doing something else, and then the name doesn't really describe it, and that will lead to confusion. So make sure that the function's name actually describes that one function. Otherwise, when you call it, you get behavior than you, well, other than what you expected, and it's baffling, and that's a problem. And since you're going to be using these function names in various places throughout your code, probably best to not go wild with the length, like 50 characters, probably pushing it, but be descriptive. It, describe what's going on. We do have a lot of horizontal space on screens nowadays, so uh, if you have to do a trade-off between descriptiveness and succinctness, probably best to describe what it does so you and other people can know. When we declared a function, we gave the names of the parameters inside those parentheses. And like I said, those looked very much like a variable declaration. And in fact, they kind of are. Because once you've done that, once your function is declared to have parameters with certain names, inside the function, you have variables with those names. So you do not need to declare them again inside the function. Their value is going to be up to the caller. So in this example on line 14, the caller decides that it wants to supply 3 as the value of the first number parameter. So on different calls of the function, the parameter values will probably be different. And again, this does pretty much what we expect. 3 is the result of first number, is, uh, excuse me, the value of first number. If we change this, maybe we add 9 and 323. Oops, one-handed typing. Sure enough, the value of first number is 9, other 323, as expected. Oh, and the order of these parameters matters. The order that you pass them when you're calling the function has to match the order in which they are declared. In this case, add is commutative, the addition operation is commutative, so that doesn't matter too much, but in other functions, yes, you definitely need to make sure that the first value is what you want to pass as the first parameter. Oh, and by the way, I even in this, in this case, all the parameters to add are ints. They do not have to match the return type. You could have a function that takes an int, returns a string. You could take a string, return a double. Uh, these are all independent. It just happens in this example that they're all ints. In that example, you saw a return statement. And you, if you're looking at the MP already, uh, you'll have seen a couple, but if not, that's, that's perfectly fine. The return statement says, we are done executing this run of the function. Please go back to the caller. I've, I've done my work. And they can appear uh, anywhere. As soon as, they don't have to be unconditional. So you could have an if state, excuse me, an if statement that contains a return statement if you only want to bail out of the function under some condition. You can have multiple return statements. Uh, 
maybe you want to, under some circumstances, return one thing, but if execution falls through and that is never reached, you have a different return statement that maybe returns some other value. And again, return immediately bails out of the current function. It, execution will not proceed past a return statement as long as it's actually executed. I mean, if it's not executed because, say, it was in an if statement whose condition was false, then it won't be run, you won't bail out. But if the execution reaches the return, you're done. It's over for that function. If the function is declared to return a value, then you have to have a return statement because you have to give some answer to the caller who is expecting you to produce something. And it has to match your declared return type. So in the add example, it's declared to return an int. If we had written a statement that returned a string, uh, that is some text, uh, that would not work. Java would complain vigorously and would not even compile the code. If the function doesn't return anything, and I'll show you in just a second how to declare a function that doesn't give an answer, then you don't have to have a return statement. You can if you want to bail out early, but it's not necessary. Once control reaches the end of the function, Java will automatically return if you don't have to return a value. Before we get into that, you may be wondering, why? Why do we have to do this Java doc? Why not just normal comments? Or why not my custom format that, that looks nicer to me? That is because we can use Javadoc. It's a convention that there are tools for to produce, quote unquote, uh, pretty web pages, like this. Now, you may be thinking the web design's a little dated, uh, probably, but you can have all of this one entry for each function, and if you say jump to one of them your param tags have been turned into things like this. Your descriptions have been turned into uh, nice text here. The return tag has been turned into that. And this is really nicely browsable uh, so that people can look at a web page rather than having to go through your code. In fact, on the MP, you will be looking at, especially in future checkpoints, our Java doc that we generated from the solution code to tell you uh, what functions you need to have. Questions on this before we proceed? Anywhere? All right, we good? All right. So now that we have the ability to package up code into a function, we can use this to do um, an algorithm because often an algorithm is in charge of one specific task like summing an array or uh, solving some data processing task like on your MP. Algorithms have inputs, data they need to work with, and a result they need to produce. And that is exactly suited to the function model of taking some parameters, returning a result. And again, we build algorithms out of the fundamentals that we've been learning up to this point. We use arithmetic operations. Uh, we store results in variables. Uh, variables can be changed in the middle of an algorithm. You can use that for accumulation, uh, like in the array sum problem. You can do different things under different circumstances with conditional statements. And when there's a lot of data you need to process or a variable number of things you need to look at, that's what loops are for. So let's do some examples. Let's say we have an array of characters and we want to find every case where we have one letter and then the letter after it is the same. So how might we approach this? What, what are we going to need? Ideas. Yes. Yep. Uh, so what he said was go through uh, every element of the array one by one. Uh, if, for example, position the value of position 2 is the same as the value of position 3, uh, we found a match, so we should note that down and update a variable. Yes, that is great. So we need to go over the entire array, and we need to compare it with the adjacent value. How are we going to do that? What feature of Java allows us to do this? Yes. 
Yep, we can use a for or while loop, exactly. And then once they're the same, we can uh, either store that in a variable or print it out. So let's try to do this. So we have an array called characters, and we're going to write a function to do this task for us. Let's say we want to return the number of times that there was an identical character next to itself. So our function should return what kind of thing? Yes. Yes, an int. So int, the return type of the function goes first. Uh, we're going to need a descriptive name for this function. Let's call it consecutive. Um, identical is a little long for typing with one hand, so we'll call it same. And what is the input to our function? What kind of thing? Ideas. Yes. Yep, a, a character array, an array of cares. And we need a name for this. Um, I guess we can call it cares. Sounds good. We open the block of our function with a curly brace. We will also whoops, need a closing brace. And like we said before, we're going to need to loop over this. Can we use an enhanced for loop for this, or are we going to have to go with the index-based for loop? Yes. Yep, index-based, because we need to know the index so that we can look at the next or the previous. So let's set up our normal for loop. Our i will be an index variable. i is less than cares.length. And increment i before we go around again. So we now need to get at the current character, which is going to be cares indexed by i. We're going to do an if because we want to check if something is the same. So our current character is at index i. We compare things using equals. And how do we get at the next one, the one after the one we're looking at? i plus 1, yep. I wonder if this will work. Oh, and of course we're going to need a variable to accumulate this. We'll declare this outside the loop, because if we declared it inside the loop, it would be reset on every run around the loop. So we put it outside. So if the current character is equal to the next character, then we found a same. And we'll increment that. And once we are done with the loop, we can tell our caller, hey, I found your answer. Here it is. Is this going to work? Oh, it will definitely not work if I do not call it, because just declaring a function does not invoke it. So we'll need to name the function that we want to call and pass it our character array, which is called characters. Oh, and by the way, the name of uh, parameters to the function is not accessible outside the function. Cares is whatever consecutive same receives, but we're going to pass characters as the cares parameter. So we run. Is this going to work? Oops, I forgot the static. Is it going to work now? Oh no, array index out of bounds. How did that happen? Yes. Yes, on the very last run when you try to do i plus 1, it's off the end of the array. How can we fix this? Yes. Yeah, we can do dot cares dot length minus one so that we stop on the penultimate entry and then check the last entry in there. Will this work? It helps if I actually print the result. All right, we got our answer of two. Does that look reasonable to us? We have a B and then another B, then a C and another C. I think we have done it. Nice. All right.
So now let's say we want to write an algorithm to take the average of an array. And as a hint, one of the problems we've already done is very, very similar to this. What might that be? Yes. Yes, finding the sum of an array, because if you want to average a bunch of things, you need to add them up and then divide by the number of elements. So let's uh, try writing a function to do this. Uh, again, we're going to need the static just for the slide sandbox to work. And this should probably return a double, because we're going to be averaging uh, double precision values. I think we can name it average. And it's going to need to take an array of doubles. Might as well call it numbers. We're going to need to accumulate the sum so far. Need a variable for that. What's a reasonable starting sum value? Bef yep, zero. Can we use an enhanced for loop here, or do we have to go with the indexed? Yeah, I hear susurrations of enhanced. Yep, because for this purpose, we just need the values. We don't need the index. So for that, we do for every double, we'll call it number in the numbers array. We accumulate its value. And then what should we return? Now that we've calculated the sum, oh, is that a, is that an answer over there? Yes. Yep, we need to divide our sum by however many numbers we have, which is the length of the numbers array. And let's call this function. And we already have this to average array declared for us, so we'll use that. Run, and yeah, we get the average of about 6.37, which looks pretty reasonable to me. Nice. So now let's do a review of one of the weekend homework problems, uh, finding the maximum of an array. So how might we go about that? If you were a human and you had a <laughs> Just imagine that you're a human. <laughs> and you had a whole pile of numbers, basically an unknown length collection of them. And you wanted to find what the biggest one of them is until you reach the end. How would we go about this? Now, as a hint, we're probably going to need to check everything, because the maximum value could be anywhere. And we're going to need to keep track of the biggest thing we've seen so far because maybe uh, there's a, a 10 somewhere uh, early in the array, but maybe later we encounter a 20. And now that should be our biggest number. Maybe there are smaller numbers later. And we don't want to set those as the maximum because we saw something bigger before. So we'll start by declaring our function with static. Going to need a semicolon on this. And since this is an int array, all the data are ints. I think maximum would be a reasonable name for this function. Its input is going to be an integer array. We'll call it numbers again. So as we're going along, what state are we going to need to be keeping track of? Do we need any variables outside our loop to remember anything? What do we think about that? Anyone in the at the the top? I haven't been looking too much at the top. Sorry. Yes. Oh, you're stretching. You're stretching. He's stretching. <laughs> well, uh, I think we are going to need one uh, variable because we have to recall what the biggest we've seen so far is. So, if we were a human going along here, we would start with the four. We see. Oh, okay. Four is the biggest thing I've seen so far, and then we look at the next element. Oh, five. That's that beats my previous best of four. So I'll hold on to that. Then we see a one, mm, that's smaller, I'll, I'll keep the, the five. 
and again with a negative 8. Oh, a 9. That's great. I'll hold on to that. And then again with a 10. And by the time we're done, our maximum we've seen so far is 10. We've exhausted the array. We've seen it all. And we can return the biggest one. I'm going to need some accumulator. Call it biggest. Now, what would happen if I initialize this to 0? Would that be a problem? Yes, because of possible negative values. So instead, let's initialize it to some value that's definitely in the array, uh, maybe the first element. Oops. Numbers uh, slice 0 is the f going to be the first datum in the array. And now we're going to go over every value in it. We could use the enhanced for loop here. Let's go ahead and do that. For every number in the numbers array, what are we going to do? We need to see if it's bigger than our current best. To do that, we will have a conditional. Because again, if, uh, if it's smaller than what we've seen already, then we, we don't want to store it. We are not interested. So only if the number is bigger than our current best, we're going to be changing this biggest value to store and recall what uh, we've done so far. Then, now, our best is this current number. Oops, helps if I type properly. Close the for loop. And once we're done with the loop, uh, we've checked every number. We've stored the biggest in this variable called biggest, and we can say to our caller, I did it. Here's your answer. And we're going to need to call this function. Actually, I think I have it on my clipboard. Sure do. Let's see how this works. Oops. Helps if. Oh, scoping issues. Biggest is not accessible outside the function, so we need to actually call it. It's passing our values array. Try this again. And the maximum is 10. Does it work if the maximum is somewhere in the middle of the array? It does. Does it work if the biggest number is at the start of the array? Those are edge cases that um, sometimes can cause trouble. It sure does. What might be a problem with this. What input to our maximum function could cause it to fail? Yes. Yes, an empty array. So if I, instead of passing values, pass an empty array, that is an integer array with zero elements, boom! Zero is out of bounds for an array with no elements. So it's unclear what to do in this case. But if you want to avoid a crash, um, just for purposes of exercising the ability to return early, let's say we want to return, uh, I don't know, maybe negative 1,000 is the smallest value you'll, you'll ever see. Uh, they probably have some other sentinel, but for purposes of demonstration, if numbers dot length is 0, then we return negative 1,000. There's also a Java constant called int min that might be uh, relevant. So now we try this, and we get negative 1,000 because there's nothing in the array. If we change this back to values, we see that our return statement here is not hit because numbers.length was not 0. So execution proceeded, and it used our loop that we wrote before. And if we wanted to do this as not a function, all we would, uh, like on the homework, we would just take out all of this stuff. And this would become just biggest. And I, kn I know my spacing is bad. Uh, oh, right. Yep, not called numbers, called values. And sure enough, it still works. Uh, this would solve um, the weekend homework problem if the spacing was correct. We just did that. 
I will take any questions in the lobby after lecture. Uh, unfortunately, I can't take them on the stage because I need to get out of the way for uh, the next lecturer. But I'll be very happy to meet you in the lobby. And you will see Jeff back again on Wednesday. Hopefully, there's another homework problem out today. Quiz 2 will have some multiple choice questions on functions. You won't be writing functions on the quiz, but you'll answer just a couple questions about them. Uh, the MP is out. Please get started. Come to office hours if you need help, and especially come to office hours if you need help setting up Android Studio. And there's early deadline points for uh, making some progress by this weekend. That's all, folks. Uh, have a great day, and I might see you in the lobby. <laughs>